those who have ever have been around long enough to to see what I did when I was younger realize that we pioneered the use of honeybees as sentinel systems so that you can measure pollution impacts and find out how far pollution from say an industrial source went and what the area of impact was and where the gradients were at for a variety of different things. And along the line, about the mid-1990s, I had a person contact me from the military, and at that time, Aberdeen Proving Grounds, 16 miles north of Baltimore, was mitigating or remediating and cleaning up a lot of their military waste sites. And because they were 16 miles north of Baltimore, and a lot of those sites they didn't have very good records on, they were really worried that if a backhoe or something were to cut into some type of barrel and it was something like a nerve gas or so on that um, the city of Baltimore itself was, and its residents were at risk. And the instruments they had at the time had a tendency to come up with a lot of false hits and they were also a little nervous I think that maybe if you had a real event they might miss it. So they said to me, well, bees bring back all these things to the hive, and you can analyze what's brought into the hive to say the bees are finding, in our case, arsenic, or radioactive materials, and whatever. Some of those must be harmful to the bee, and could you set the bee up like a canary? So that if we breach something, it would affect the bees, and the moment the bees were affected, we'd get an alert. And I did what I always do and scared the heck out of my crew and my fellow partners is I always say yes, you know, and then we figure out how to do it afterwards. So we put the first beehives online in 1995. A little bit later, a guy came to us and said, well, if you can find these things with bees and you can set them up to warn of something toxic out there because something the bees do, could you get the bees to show you where they found the stuff that is of concern? And again, I said yes. Tomorrow I'll show you the outcome of that. So when colony collapse disorder occurred in the fall of 2006, beekeepers in Florida called me in Montana and said, can you come look at our problem? And I said, I'm not a bee disease person. Why do you want me to come look at your problem? Because you're the high tech guy. If there's an answer out there or a new way of looking at things, you're the guy who has it. And I said, well, I really don't, but I'll come look at your problem. But then we got a little a little notice in a, a blurb that uh, in our local newspaper that we had um, we were looking at the problem and pretty soon a guy calls me up and says you remember me I toured your facility about a year or so ago he says how'd you like a better way of looking at viruses and I said great because I think we were looking at something contagious we're seeing colonies and bee yards where they, they're collapsing and the next day there are more of them and the day after that there are more or we see big stockpile areas where Last week, the north end of the, the, the run started to show a problem. There's maybe five, ten thousand 10,000 colonies in this field. And day by day, it just moved like a wave across the field. We found beekeepers who essentially interacted and shared equipment and so on with each other. And they all had the problem and so on. Everything about it sounded to us like a contagious disease. So virus was a good possibility. And this guy basically was just living, you know, working, he was in telecommunications, he was working with the Valley Promise, his name is Dave Wick. And I said, but why are you asking me about this? And he said, well, remember I told you, he said that I have some contact with the military. And he says, military's got some technologies that I have a license to uh, transfer or see if we can promote. And he says, uh, it's coming out of Edgewood, Aberdeen Proving Ground. Well, then I said, sort of, sat up and took notice because the, uh, the chemical and biological command at Edgewood, the Edgewood Chemical and Biological Center, is the premier institution for the U.S. Army in terms of developing methods and techniques for the protection of the welfare of our troops against things like bio-warfare agents. So all of a sudden, you know, Dave is a nice guy. Dave's working from his house. But Dave's telling me he has access to technologies in Edgewood. And if you want to, you know, this is something that often isn't considered to be a, you know, I don't think most students, most of our college students, don't necessarily think of the military as a hotbed of science. But you'd be surprised what the military does and so on. And so I said, you know, bring it on. Let's see what you've got. And so he introduced us to a group at Edgewood. He introduced us to two technologies. One is a instrument. It's a unique instrument. There are only a dozen in the world and only two up and running. One's at Edgewood and one's in 
in Montana. Dave is now set up and is running this, and if you want to screen bees for viruses, this instrument can screen for every virus in your bee colonies all at one time and give you the titers of them. Now, I can't necessarily tell you the names of all of them, but it can tell you how many viruses you have based on their physical size and their distributions in terms of how much. And if you want to know, if you're, say, trying a management technique and say, I wonder if this is improving the health of my bees in terms of damping down the viruses or how the viruses are going or do I have lots of viruses at a high level, contact Dave for $50 a sample. He can run them. And as I say, you've got the only instrument of this type that's in the commercial sector that's accessible. And I work real hard with Dave to make that technology available to you. But there was another technology, and this is called proteomics and I'm you know I know you're a mix of folks here but you have probably all heard about DNA and genes and mapping the human gene uh, and when they start talking about genes as a whole they talk about genomics and you get into things where you're talking about uh, they're using things the little pieces of the DNA like the PCR they did in the OJ Simpson case uh, and so on where you can basically identify things on the gene base. Well, we used to think that each gene produced one protein. Well, after we mapped the human genome, we found that was wrong. One gene may, may, may essentially turn on and off the production of multiple proteins. And so genes are kind of like blueprints, and they can basically turn things on and off, but it's the proteins and the interactions that actually do everything. And so the counterpart to genomics is something called proteomics, looking at the proteins. And there are millions of them. And there are databases that are built and changed every day as labs essentially identify new ones or what they are and put them into the databases. And so another way of looking at this is to look at the proteins. And so we did. And I'm going to show you what we found. Now, on October 5th of this year, in a online journal called the Public Library Online Services, or PLOS, P-L-O-S, one, because there's a PLOS biology and a PLOS this and that, you want the PLOS one, but we published this paper called the Ritavirus and Microsporidium Linked to Honeybee Colony Decline. Now, translation, you know the Microsporidium, Nosema, specifically Nosema serrana. All right, so we used to, I'm old enough, to, we used to call Nosemas protozoans. But in more recent times, the people that name these things, so they're not, they're microsporidium. Actually, they're closer to a fungus, much more fungus-like than anything. So it's kind of a working construct. Think of Nosema like a fungus. Well, we have the fungus plus a virus but a very unusual virus, because this is something called an erudovirus from the word iridescent, which the students sleeping in the corner here, behind the, their instructor. <laughs> what's iridescent? What's what is iridescent? If you're not gonna be in my audience and sleep. <laughs> what's iridescent? Why do you must know what iridescent is? All right, reflecting light <coughs> for almost fluorescent type colors and so on. Very good. Even if it wasn't from the young student, the younger student. <laughs> it's a young student, just not <laughs> we have younger. All right, so this is also unusual in that most B viruses that are known, and certainly those that are considered to be of concern to beekeepers and beekeeping are what we call RNA viruses. But if you remember your basic biology, you've got the double-stranded helix called DNA. This is a DNA virus, which makes it a very different type of virus than an RNA virus. We found it not because we set up to go looking for it. We found it because we screened all of the samples we got for all of the peptides and proteins they had. So there was no bias from the investigators as to what we were going to find. We generally got 14,000 or more peptides per sample. 
took us a while to sort through all that. The Army that did the Army lab at Edgewood did all of the analysis. So if you've read some of the um, articles that appeared right after our paper by a certain reporter that had an agenda who said who wanted to essentially say that somehow I personally am trying to exonerate pesticides and our paper says nothing about pesticides. We didn't have any money to look at pesticides and so on. But regardless of what you think about that, do you really want to think that the U.S. Army falsified data to exonerate pesticides? If you've got to buy into that, then, you know, I'm not going to be able to dissuade you. But it's the U.S. Army that did the analysis work. And in that 18 investigators, we have uh, the U.S. Army, four universities, four private companies, and we cover the spectrum from virology to chemistry to quantitative ecology. So we've got quite a team. And most of my team are mid-career to senior sciences and so on. So I've got 18 people on here that essentially are known in their fields, including two of the world's experts in the riddle virus. And they came in late because once we found this thing, we looked at each other and said, what is an riddle virus? What's a DNA virus doing in here? Is this real? And so we found out the guy down in Mexico, uh, Trevor Williams, came over from England, got his uh, advanced education, did his degrees in the States, and now is a uh, researcher and faculty member down in Mexico. And he has literally written a book on Irritable Viruses. Tag in his name, you'll find the books. Uh, and so on. And he's on the international naming groups and so on. And he was intrigued by this. And as soon as we talked to him, then he gave us some really constructive guidance as to how to proceed. So, we're going to talk about aritaviruses for a while. Uh, I know most of you have, unless you've read our paper, and you may have, because the amazing thing of this, and you might be able to see this, as of Monday, 48,145 people have downloaded this paper. That's phenomenal. You know, I'm not sure who all those people are, but it's phenomenal. It's got everybody scratching their heads. So I guess we have a hit or um, something. Anyway, let's go on and talk about this for a bit. All right, so our 18 authors. We've got the Edgewood Chemical and Biological Center in Maryland. That's where all the mass spectrometry based proteomics was done. We got the University of Montana. I and my colleagues essentially are the coordinators. We took all the samples, we shipped all the samples, and my and Colin Henderson, the quantitative ecologist, worked closely with the Army so that we could sort and statistically analyze all this data. <coughs> Montana State University, again, like with Dave Wick, after we got this started, I got a phone call. A new fungal pathologist expert came to Montana State, not, not your MSU, but Montana State in Bozeman. I'm from the University of Montana, Missoula. But Montana State, Rob Kramer called up and said, I'm a fungal pathologist. Sounds like you might have some need of a fungal pathologist. I said, boy, do I. And so he did all the NOSEMA backup work and verifications and so on, and the inoculation trials I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> Texas Tech provided some uh, raw material for testing. He had actually cultures of a riddle virus uh, from other insects. And Trevor down in Veracruz at the Institute of Ecology uh, was, was our mainstay in terms of understanding this whole ir iridescent virus and, and taking the next steps to verify what we thought we had. All right, so our major findings. In 2006, the week before Christmas, I saw my first cases of collapsing colonies in Florida. I sent team members from my team to Pennsylvania, to Georgia, to California. We all saw the same thing, and we all talked to beekeepers who had worked with one of the beekeepers one of the others of us was working with. So we saw linkages right away uh, between the operations that had the problem, which is why we quickly decided that maybe we were looking at something contagious as a working hypothesis. There seemed to be no rhyme or reason to where these colonies were located, agricultural, more urban areas. There was no rhyme or reason. There was nothing consistent about the crops they were on or the chemicals looked up, used on the crops or the weather other than it tended to show up in cool, damp, wet areas, particularly after an usually unseasonably bad event of weather. Um, 
we some of them had mites, some of them didn't have mites, but what we saw were these colonies that obviously had been booming, going strong, and then all of a sudden they just catastrophically collapsed with hardly any bees left. Often the queen was still there, laying her little heart out. And um, they were trying the struggling, they would collapse down to the queen and a, and a handful, a fist sized ball of young bees, very, very young bees. Sometimes they collapsed all the way out and there was nobody there. But most of the time, the queen was there with this, with this little cluster of young, young bees. And if they've been laying brood, four, five, six frames of brood at times sitting there, and you know that that little cluster of bees in that queen couldn't have produced those and so on. And it just went like a wave through these operations. You know, once it started, you know, all you could do is hang on to your hat and wait for it to roll out and see how bad it was. Operations with 90% or more. Now, I get real upset by the folks that say that this is just bad beekeeping. Baloney. Bad beekeeping may not help your cause, but good beekeeping is no insurance that you're not going to get it. And recently in New York, all of a sudden, for the first time, they have had what they call colony collapse or think might be colony collapse and so on. If you haven't seen it, bless your lucky stars and it's probably nothing you're doing that is essentially protecting you from it. Now, this is our, our observation. We have looked at colony collapse operations 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10. We were the major wave of it last year, but it didn't make the media again. But uh, huge collapses uh, across, uh, in last year. This year, this media year, it seems like things are pretty good. Uh, it's kind of spot. We have some, some operations in spot. But if you're running 10,000 colonies and your granddad ran bees and your dad ran bees and now you're running bees and you got 10,000 colonies one day and you got 5,000 the next and 2,000 you know a week later or something like that, tell me how you're going to do on that. And then add to the fact that if this plays out when you're in California, you got dead equipment sitting at the other end of the country from where you're at and you're from Michigan, you're going to have to ship all that empty equipment stuff back or burn it in the field and restock. And you will, your crews will work themselves to death because they'll be out there and you'll grade out to see what you've got to rent. And today you've got X number of colonies and tomorrow it's X minus whatever collapsed from yesterday and the day after that it's even fewer. And so the crews just went through over and over and over again uh, checking them. If you're really unlucky, they all collapsed before you could rent any of them and so you didn't get any rental fees either and so on. And it was not uncommon during the entire period, especially in 2007, where the crews wore themselves out and just said to the beekeeper, that's it, I didn't sign on for this, and left, abandoned their beekeepers, and so on. You don't see that in the press, but I do. Try being out with one of these guys when it first hits, especially when they didn't know about it, and so on. And watch, you know, beekeepers tend to be physically fairly good-sized folks. I mean, as I know there are some small stature beekeepers, but like most beekeepers, I got a six inch scar up my back from uh, busting my back on beehives and so on. And it's physically hard work. And if you don't have the physique to deal with it and so on, um, you know, you're probably not going to, especially the guys running lots and lots of bees and so on. There are exceptions, but generally, beekeepers are pretty physically strong folk. See some of these guys. Watch a, say, watch a guy that looks like a linebacker out in his field and watch his face as he pulls the cover and more and more and more. And he knew he had a problem, but when I show up, he finds out it's even worse. I've seen these guys break down and cry right in those yards. Some men that you would think never would and such. So don't tell me this is bad beekeeping. And anybody that basically has that sanctimony as I'm better, you know, I've never had it type of thing. So I have no tolerance for it because I have seen this too much. This is devastating when you get it, and it can bankrupt you. And it did, some of them. So 